Well, I, I'd like to do two things. I'd like to um, go over some of the history that uh, has already been mentioned by Eduardo and by several uh, speakers. And then I'd like to talk a little bit to try to go above the, the, the problem and look at general strategy questions and things that have uh, frustrated me personally over, over the years. Um, but first, I, I'd like to th say big, a big thank you to, to you, Xavier, and to the CNES for organizing this. This is really a dream come true for many of us. You should know that we've really had this dream of bringing together all the, you know, all the people who uh, have given their time to this research and, uh, and, and compare notes. I think it's, it's really great. So thank you. Um, now I have to master this technology. I, I'll push this. Okay. This is roughly what I'd like to do. First, um, give a, a brief history of uh, uh, data collection and retrieval systems, going over some of the material that has been mentioned. Uh, I've been involved most recently with a project in the United States called Capella that I'd like to describe uh, generally. And then I'd like to ask the question, you know, in science, when you're confronted with a new phenomenon, there are two things you need to do. You need to make a list, which we've never done, of what is it that needs to be explained. And then you have to make a list of researchable issues. Starting from ideology doesn't get you anywhere. And I think we, we need to go through a turning point in the study of, of this whole domain, away from ideology. We are not, as several speakers have said before, we are not here to prove that we are being visited by you know, aliens from this planet or that star. That may very well be true, but we have not done the basic work. And if tomorrow there was the so-called disclosure that many researchers in in America are hoping for, we would be unable to answer a number of very basic questions, and that's what I, I would like to call your attention to those, those questions today. So I've, I've tried to do a, a rough, this is not complete, and we, we all know it's not complete, but I want to show the major uh, phases of the cataloging of, of UFOs. Um, really all started with Project Blue Book in the 1950s, 1954, hired the Battelle Institute, which is, a, yes, which is a major think tank in the United States, based in Ohio, to do really the first compilation of cases received by the U.S. Air Force. And they, they issued their famous report in 1954-55. Um, Heineck was already involved as Dr. Alan Heineck as the scientific advisor to the Air Force. Uh, that project was, uh, the whole project blue book was terminated with the Condon report that compiled its own um, catalog. As, uh, as mentioned before, um, the, during the Condon report, the UFOCAT catalog was started by Saunders, and I donated at that point my catalog of about 3,000 cases that I had started with my wife. I had really started collecting things in the late 50s, and my wife and I uh, compiled the first catalog in uh, 1962, based on the files of Guy Quincy and on the, um, on the files of Aimé Michel and on our own data. And then um, Claude Poher, of course, started his, his own catalog, the Gépin, uh, with, uh, and these are not the names of the managers, these are the names of the people who actually worked on the compilation of the database, uh, Jean-Jacques Velasco and, and, and now uh, yourself. Uh, the Larry Hatch catalog is inactive. A number of these catalogs have not continued. Um, Dr. Haynes uh, and uh, Dominique Weinstein have continued there with the pilot sightings database. Um, 
under uh, Bigelow Aerospace, uh, under two organizations, the National Institute for Discovery Science and the uh, Bigelow Aerospace uh, Special Systems, developed uh, a number of catalogs, and that is now inactive. And so you, ca you can see how many are still collecting actively. <laughs> there are a number of other efforts in other countries uh, with Felix, uh, Professor Felix Ziegel in, in Russia, and uh, of course the UK uh, Mi Ministry of Defense and so on. So there are a number of these uh, experiences from which we can draw many useful lessons. Capella uh, was, um, when um, Robert Bigelow at Bigelow Aerospace asked me to help um, create a, a, a data repertory for his institute, I told him, you probably don't want a database. Uh, what, and in, in industry today, I think we've moved um, very much beyond the idea of databases to the idea of a data warehouse where you have a number of catalogs or a number of databases that may or may not have uh, exchanges of data within them based on the nature of the data and the nature of the project. Um, so we built a, a data warehouse with 11 different databases collected in both internally and externally, um, including, for example, the Blue Book database, but also including some proprietary internal uh, data that, uh, that we uh, uh, recovered. Uh, the, the database had a number of links to external uh, non-structured data, like photographs, radar data, recordings, videos, maps, and uh, satellites, so that um, there was a, a very wide uh, range of types of information that could be uh, collected together for specific uh, purposes. Um, so the, the question arises of what is it that is researchable? If tomorrow, um, for example, the US government said, okay, you know, the UFOs are real, uh, there would be a lot of pressure on all of us to come up with a number of very legitimate answers to which we have absolutely no answer. For example, are there global patterns in the data? Well, we think there are, and we have bits and pieces of, of answers, but we don't have something. If you were called tomorrow before the French Academy of Sciences, you would have a lot of trouble talking about global patterns in the data. What are the physical facts of the phenomenon? I don't think we would agree on that if we took a, uh, if we had a general discussion on that. What is the phenomenon? Are there special locations where it manifests, or is it pretty much all over the place? What are the social and cultural factors? What is the impact on humans? That hasn't been mentioned so far in this discussion. And what methodology is applicable, especially what software technology is applicable. So let's talk about global patterns, and I'll go very quickly through these categories. How long has this phenomenon manifested? When did it start? Did it start in, on June 24, 1947, with Kenneth Arnold on, in his airplane? Or did it start in, with the airships in uh, 1896? Or did it start with the Roman Empire? That question is a question that I'm very interested in, and I'm working, trying to, to, to get some data to answer that question. But I think, again, that question is very open. What are the overall patterns from the available data? Is there a pseudo-random model behind these events? We've talked about waves, but these waves are not periodic. Now, there is a whole field of mathematics that has to do with waves that are not periodic. And they are extremely interesting. They are also very interesting in sociology or in psychology. We have not really looked at that. Um, does it suggest ongoing interaction of something with humanity, something that could be internal or that could be external? 
I think we have to answer that before we start talking about you know, aliens from somewhere. Is there a cyclical patterns of waves that can be used to forecast the timing and localization of future waves? I mean, if that's true, then we can go there with special equipment and catch them. We haven't done that yet. Is it correlated with na known natural cycles, physical, astronomical, biological, and so on? What relationships emerge when witness-centered parameters are taken into account? Does the phenomenon select its witnesses? The physics, okay. We think we know a lot about the physics of UFOs. Well, what are the various types of manifestations? Is an orb, is it a flying saucer? When does a flying saucer turn into an orb? Um, what about light, sounds, structured objects? How do they combine in different situations? We have examples of all of those in single cases and in combined cases. How do we sort them out? What are the measurable effects? What can we measure? We, uh, we can measure light energy output, material composition, compass readings, magnetic remanence, radioactivity. There are a number of things we can measure. Are we consistently doing that? And in what cases does it make sense to measure that? Uh, if uh, somebody sees a globe of light coming through the wall of their bedroom in the middle of the night, what are the things you want to measure? What new equipment needs to be designed to improve collection, preservation, analysis? How many cases involve impact on plant life, on insect life? Have we really looked into that? How can insects and microorganisms be recruited as enhanced detectors or as measuring devices? We really haven't done that. Why is there no reliable, authenticated photograph, Francois, uh, of a UAP with appreciable detail? Is it the problem, is the problem with our equipment? Or is it a feature of the phenomenon that it does something so that the photographs are not corresponding to the visual description that a reliable witness is giving us. And we have cases uh, exactly like that. Special locations, what are the characteristics of information-rich areas? Um, the uh, Bigelow Institute actually bought a, a piece of land in the middle of Utah where there were intense manifestations over the years and instrumented it so that we could capture everything all the time. Uh, Col de Vence, uh, Yakima Valley, the Orals cluster in Russia, Hesdalen, and so on. I mean, how many of these are there? And are they really significant or not? How does the behavior of phenomenon change when it's confronted with special measures? It seems sometimes that the phenomenon loves gadgets. Gadgets going from cameras, satellites, um, all kinds of uh, magnetometers, it, it likes to play with them. It likes to do something with them. Um, uh, how do you design something that will resist that kind of environment? What could be expected from spatial observation programs at specific locations? Cultural factors. Did the phenomenon really change its behavior in 1947? Or was that a side effect of the American media? It was the end of the war. There were the atomic explosions. There were uh, American mythology and American imagery changed completely in 1947. Um, can we look at other parts of the world and see if there was a change? Um, how does the phenomenon evolve as a function of geography, culture, physical parameters? If you go to India and you talk to people about strange things in the sky and strange lights, and strange creatures coming out of it. They've been talking about that for the last 2,000 years. I mean, what else is new, okay? So uh, how does the culture affect the kind of data or the kinds of reports that we're going to be getting? Uh, I had certainly that experience in Brazil. How does the phenomenon react to human technology, sensors, <laughs> nuclear devices, 
high technologies? Are there global cycles in the phenomenon's relationship to humanity and vice versa? Does it like to that do, do the waves coincide with intense changes, for example, with the landing on the moon or with uh, specific space, um, space projects or with atomic explosions? Does the phenomenon anticipate or mimic our inventions as it seems to be the case with the, um, the, the cigar cases uh, in, in the 19th century? Uh, is that simply an effect of the press uh, or uh, hoaxes? Or is there really something about the, the phenomenon itself in its image, its appearance? And uh, does it show a special interest in social upheavals or wars or uh, times of intense emotional energy in, on our planet? Finally, what's the impact on humans? And this is probably something that has been least analyzed. What is the range of physiological and pathological effects on humans and animals? We have lots of anecdotes, but have, I, I, is there an MD in the room? Is there a medical doctor in the room? You're an MD? You're one. <laughs> um, does that vary across cultures? How do these effects vary with distance, altitude, type of object, time of day, and so on? Under what circumstances does the interaction result in benefits from humans, healing, that's sometimes reported, enhanced consciousness? Um, what are the characteristics of situations where it's a threat to humans as opposed to other apparent behavior? And under what circumstances is communication, whatever it is, reported by the witnesses? Finally, methodology. Can analysis disclose evidence of a control system? And by control system, I don't mean an outside intelligence necessarily. I mean, ecology is a control system. You know, the weather is a control system. Uh, the uh, ocean is a control system. We, we're surrounded with control systems. Some of them are artificial, some of them are natural. Does it, is there evidence, is there a way of finding out if it's a control system? Uh, in this room, there is a control system, which is the air conditioning system in the room. The temperature right now is the same as the temperature at 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, can we prove that? Well, we could prove that by starting a fire. You know, if, if we start burning the stage here, presumably there will be some source of cold air that will start running, and we can detect that, and then we know we're inside a control system. Well, can we do that with this phenomenon? Can we determine what is the reference signal in this room, it would be heat. Well, what is it that triggers, that makes the UFO phenomenon appear? What should the size and scope of the database be in order to support hypothesis testing? Do we have enough data? And that was you know, the question that uh, Mikael asked and that uh, you know, um, Eduardo asked. You know, how, big does, how many cases do we need of what type before we can start asking the questions we want to ask. How sensitive is it to culture, language, epoch? What form of reasoning is appropriate? Deductive, inductive, abductive reasoning? There is a basic problem in epistemology here that uh, we have not posed, really. What are the patterns of mimicry used by the phenomenon? Does it mimic? something in, in our behavior. Uh, can we separate the underlying technology from things that it may be simulating? When we see something in the shape of a rocket, is it really a rocket or is it, can it take different, can it present different looks or different images to us? Uh, our technology can do that already. I mean, you know, look at the stealth, look at the, the advanced uh, fighters that we have, look at the, the, uh, the drones. You can, we, we're already projecting simulacra 
in, uh, in a lot of different situations. So this is not um, <coughs> completely weird. And finally, can we test our hypothesis reliably? In other words, given a hypothesis with good statistical support, could a skeptic or uh, an outside skeptic prove the opposite hypothesis? I mean, if you give me a catalog of UFOs and you give me a hypothesis, I can prove your hypothesis. But if somebody else gives me the opposite hypothesis, I can also prove it. And that's a very interesting logical problem. It's not an unknown problem. It's a problem that happens in many cases. It happens in physics. You know, if you can, you can prove that uh, uh, waves and you can prove particles. But waves and particles are not compatible. Okay? But you, you have to deal with the two different situations. You can prove the hypothesis that light is a wave. You can also prove the hypothesis that light is a particle. Now, I'd like to conclude with one, I think, very important observation, that all these things we can research today with the talent that is in this room, with the current tools available to science. This is not like what CNES does. I mean, CNES develops new new science, new technology, new tools to new sensors. We don't need to do that. We have all the current tools to, to address the problems I have listed uh, without any preconceived ideology and without using the extraterrestrial hypothesis as a dominant hypothesis to be tested now. We can, we can do that with the tools of science. What, what are we afraid of? I mean, that's the main question I've, I've had for many years. You know, why don't we do it? Now, a lot of work has already been done by scientists, by people like uh, Claude Poher, like people like Peter Stuart, people like Alan Hynek. Uh, we've been using our scientific training, and many of you in the room, we've used our scientific training to apply it to this problem. That's not science. That's not what science does. Science starts from, from that, that kind of um, volunteer you know, passion. But then you need resources, you need structure, you need the kinds of things that uh, Michael has been, has been showing us. You need collaboration, you need some form of institution so that you can move forward. So future projects will need long-term vision and support. They, uh, th there are no magical technical solutions. There is no computer you can buy with special software that will solve the problem. The tools, and here I'm speaking as, as a software, you know, as a, as a computer um, geek. Uh, the, the tools uh, have to admit unstructured data, which means SQL, you know, we may have to go to a no SQL structure. It has to handle natural language. We, yes, we need structured questionnaires, but by now, I mean, this is 2014. We know how to analyze uh, natural language. Um, we need to process graphic information. The deep knowledge of the phenomenon in the field is essential. The database is only as good as access to the people who put the data in the database. If you don't have those people, and by the way, we're getting older. If you don't have those people, the database is worthless. It's essentially a bucket of bits. You know, it's essentially something in a computer. But you need the people who have the deep knowledge of those cases, the people who remember who went to the field and, and studied it. They, you need to support different communities, and then localized studies are an ideal test bed. And in that respect, I'd like to point to uh, uh, Jean-Francois Boedek's analysis, which is, I, I think, one of the posters, about a study he did in Brittany uh, of, of a very specific region of France 
where he studied all the cases that he could get and did special statistics. I think that kind of thing on the local level, if you can generalize it to different areas, will be extremely uh, valuable. The, the main thing I'd like to leave you with is that the ufology has no ontology. Someone said earlier that we're in the same situation as a naturalist classifying insects or plants. Well, if you classify insects, you may not know what that insect is, but you, know how, you can tell how many legs it has, how many wings, how many eyes. Here, we don't have that. We don't know. We only, we only define UFOs by exclusion. You know, somebody comes with a report, and it's not this, and it's not that, and it's not the moon, and it's not a cloud, and it's not a satellite, and it's not a meteor. Therefore, it ends up being, we end up calling it a UAP or a UFO. There, there is a problem like that in mathematics. It's prime numbers. If I give you, you know, 521,233, and I ask you if it's a prime number, you have no way of doing that, of knowing that by looking at the number. Now, we're, we're in the same situation. What you do in mathematics, you say prime numbers are among the positive, you know, uh, odd integers that can only be divided by one and themselves. And you test them by looking at all the positive, you know, odd integers up to the square root of that number. And after you do that, you know, which can take a long time if you have a, 40 digit number then you would find you will find out if it's prime or not and uh, the definition we have of ufos was a definition that uh, heineck and i produced back in the 60s which is exactly that you, uh, uaps are found among the set of reports that do not correspond to um, uh, all the known natural phenomena that we have tested against. And so we have no ontology, which is a big problem for, you know, for the software. Because in, if the CNES hires me as a programmer to make a catalog of all the parts in this satellite, you know, I would have to be a very bad programmer if I couldn't do that. Because every part in that satellite has a part number and is described very precisely. With UFOs, we don't have that. And we have to handle, you know, it's a, a big challenge that, uh, that we have to tackle with uh, non-structured data. Thank you very much.